Hello, everybody. I am so happy that once again you chose to join us for our Thursday Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come asking that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. Father, I pray that this lesson will touch uh, hearts and, and help us to have a personal relationship with you. Father, I thank you and I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, uh, of course, are still on the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. And so we will start today with Romans uh, 7, 25. And all our scripture will be the NIV unless otherwise stated. So Romans 7, 25 says, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And so if you remember last time, we got our shout on. The shout was the gospel that God, through his son, Jesus, is our deliverer. We saw that we are delivered. And this week's lesson is the practical side of the shout. See, it, it's, it's one thing to shout. It feels good, and you just want to stay there and bask in his glory. You know, like Peter, James, and John at the Transfiguration. You want to stay up on the mountaintop and build temples. But Jesus didn't even, when they said, it is good for us to be here, we should build a temp three temples, you know, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Jesus didn't even have a conversation with them about, he, he didn't even, it, it, it's as if they didn't say anything. Instead, he led them down from the mountain to the valley, which is where most of us live with real problems. That is where we land after the shout in the valley with the question, how do I live with, with the backdrop of the shout or, or to put it bluntly, now what? How do I live now that I have been delivered? Now that I'm free? Freedom is a wonderful thing. We all want it. We all strive to have the euphoria that it brings. Back in my day, there was a songstress named Denise Williams who was known as simply Nisi or the songbird. She had a hit called Free. And, and, and when she belted out the chords, you knew two things. You knew why she was given the nickname, the songbird. And if only for a minute, only for a moment, you experienced the euphoria of being free. But in a little under three minutes, the song was over. It, it was all over. I don't know how long Peter, James, and John were on the mountain with Jesus, but I do know that Jesus took them back down the mountain and told them, and, and this is me paraphrasing, he, he says, let's move on, guys, and, and, and don't go telling anybody about what just happened. And, and in essence, he was saying, there's work to do in the valley. Uh, there's everyday stuff 
to be dealt with in the valley. Don't you agree that everyday life happens in the valley? We, we are blessed to have some mountaintop experiences every now and then. But that's not where most of us live. Now, I know, you know, that there are some people that live on what we call a natural high. And, you know, we might say to those people, I want some of what you got. But for the most part, most of us live in and out of the valleys of life. So after last week's lesson, after the shout, I was like, okay, Lord, what now? I, I stalled out. I was like, I was like the rest of the disciples that were at the foot of the mountain in the valley. By the way, this story can be found in Matthew, the 17th chapter, or Mark, the 9th chapter. But the disciples were down there at the, foot of the at the foot of the mountain, which is the valley. They were down there tapped out. A man brought his son to them to be healed. And it was not happening. When the man saw Jesus, he bypassed the disciples and went straight to Jesus. And Jesus healed his son. Matthew, the 17th chapter, verse 19 and 20 says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? In essence, why couldn't we heal the man, the man's son? Verse 20 says, he replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now let's put that together with the uh, first portion of our main verse. Romans 7 25 the the first portion the a portion says thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord that word thank is a faith word it says I believe that Jesus Christ is my deliverer from sin thank you I believe I am no longer sin's slave thank you I believe that I am no longer a prisoner of sin, but I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Thank you. My help comes not from myself, but from my Savior. Thank you, Lord. Victory comes only through the living, only through and in the living God. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, this is the uh, New King James Version. It, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in, tr in Christ. So after the shout, we are to be fate talking, fate walking, fate acting followers of Jesus Christ. Now right Right, right here, the legalist folk thought in their minds, okay, I got this. I'm, I'm to do more of what I already do. More of the thou shall nots and more of the thou shall do's. But that's exactly what we are not to do. That is not freedom. That is legalism. Remember, in Christ's death, I died to the law, and in his resurrection, I am alive. Uh, I'm joined in marriage to Christ, and, and it's a love relationship, not a law or legal relationship. The love relationship is what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not a religion. Now, I know that that sounds blasphemous to some people. But I invite you to hear me out before shutting me out. I know that it's easy to think that, that the Christian life 
it is it consists of a bunch of reading the Bible, praying, witnessing, and, and doing and not doing certain things. We all know how a Christian ought to speak. We all know how a Christian ought to act. We know how uh, a Christian ought to live. I mean, we know the kinds of things a Christian ought to do or not do. You can ask any non-Christian and they can tell you that, right? As believers and followers of Christ, we are married to Christ. It's a love relationship. Christianity is not a religion. We didn't get delivered to just start a religion. It's a relationship to a person, the son of God. It's not doing something, but it's knowing somebody or knowing someone. It is not a set of rules and it's not a system of morals. It's a unique and intimate relationship with the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent to save us. In the beginning of chapter 7, Paul uses the marriage relationship to explain our new position. Uh, our, our, our new position since deliverance. Think about that. In a marriage, there are many things the husband must do. And, and there are many things, uh, well, there, there are duties he must carry out, responsibilities he must meet, obligations he must perform. And, and why does he do it? I can hear some men saying, because of the honeydew list. Well, no, it's because he has decided to love a person, namely his wife. Then on the flip side, a wife does many things. Cook the meals, wash the dishes, do the laundry, clean the floors, do the homework, and the list can go on and on and on and on and on. And why does she do all these things? It's not because of a list of thou shalt or thou shalt not. She is doing these things because she is responding to the love of her husband. The marriage relationship is based on love, not law. In the same way, the Christian life is knowing a person, loving him, seeking to please him, walking with him, honoring him, obeying him, rejoicing in him, delighting in him, trusting in him, growing in him, talking to him, talking to others about him, abiding in him, learning of him, learning from him, sitting at his feet and enjoying his presence. Having that type of intimate love relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will change everything we do. It will change the way we pray. It will change the way we study our Bibles. It will change our witnessing. It will literally change everything about us. It will make us brand new. It will, it, it will just change us inside and out. I'll close today's lesson with a few heart, that's E-H-E-A-R-T, a few heart questions. As we go throughout each day, are we walking with a person and enjoying him? Or are we following a religion, a, a, a legalistic routine? Are we walking with a person or are, are, or are we working at a, relation, at a religion? Can we say from our hearts, I know this person as my savior? my lord my friend my sovereign master my helper my shepherd my ever-present companion do i know him as my everything do i know him 
as my everything.